Live podcast where we put you on the map. This is Ron Costa broadcasting live in the Mappable USA studios in Las Vegas. And we continue our discussions about Opportunity Zones. It's been crazy. Uh, we're going to bring on the Opportunity Zone Authority expert, and of course, Vicki Hachmala. How are you doing today, Vicki? I'm doing great today, Ron. Beautiful day in Vegas. We are looking forward to the Opportunity Zone Expo happening this week, Thursday, Friday at Mandalay Bay. And today we, our guest is one of the speakers who will present at that expo. Yes, exactly. And uh, you know, the last show, we did a show about uh, tax implications of the Opportunity Zones. And that show, believe it or not, raised a, a number of questions. So uh, we're going to have to kind of get back to those guys but let's uh, let's introduce uh, Paul Wasgren from uh, DLA Piper. Paul, are you there? How are you doing today? Good afternoon. Well, thank you both for having me on the show. Great. We our pleasure. Our pleasure. So um, you're obviously uh, involved in Opportunity Zones as well. Uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself and your background and how you kind of got into this whole Opportunity Zones industry? Yeah, happy to do that. Uh, well, Vicki and Ron, thanks again for having me on. I'm very enthusiastic, as I can hear from the two of you, uh, about this new space. Obviously, we're seeing a lot of excitement throughout the country, and uh, in particular here in the West, in California and Nevada. Um, I will be speaking at that conference, you're exactly right, and hosting a panel. Uh, this is the second panel on which I'll be speaking uh, in connection with the organizers of the event. I thought uh, the first in Los Angeles was really well done back in January, and since then, obviously, this particular concept has gained momentum, and we've seen an increase in deal activity. Uh, I first got involved in mid-2018. Uh, I think we were one of the very first firms to, to do a qualified opportunity fund for a long-term client of mine, and we pushed uh, print on that deal literally days after the first proposed rules and regulations were promulgated by the U.S. Treasury in uh, October. So oh. our, our first deal was a blind pool fund, a half a billion dollars, uh, for a long-term client of mine out of Florida. They have 200 properties that happen to be in qualified opportunity zones, mainly in the southeastern United States in that instance. And since then, we've been doing a variety of deals, mainly single-asset structured deals, but we're starting to see an increase in multi-asset structures now that we've received the second proposed rules and regulations, giving a little clearance on, on that structure. So again, I share your enthusiasm, and uh, we've gotten heavily involved in this space over the last uh, seven, eight months. Yeah, it's interesting. So most of the people that you're dealing with now, are they, are they real estate developers? Or are, they, are they just people who just own property and are looking to team up with developers? How, how, how are you seeing that? Most of our clients are sponsors and or developers of real estate. Each of the deals, I should clarify, on which I've worked so far has been real estate centric. Obviously, with the latest rules and regulations, we may see a shift now in favor of non-real estate deals. Uh, but uh, certainly, it has been real estate heavy. And a lot of my long-term clients are in that space. So this is a, a natural progression for us. And we're very excited about uh, doing syndicated deals uh, for these clients and allowing them to, to enhance their returns for themselves and investors through this new tax concept. When you say real estate-centric, what, what does that encompass? So the typical structure that we see on uh, my desk would be the development of a piece of real property, wherever it might be sited in a zone. Uh, or multiple properties, uh, potentially in the blind pool, for instance. Uh, and it, it's structured in the way that we typically see. So the QOF owns a QOZ business, and that QOZ business is the title holder of real property. In some cases, it borrows money to develop uh, that same property. Um, as opposed to a pure business play, and we're going to start to see more of those, I think, in the months ahead, where the Qualified Opportunity Zone business is not real estate centric, meaning that uh, it is an operating business that may be physically located within a Qualified Opportunity Zone, but its business is not in itself real estate development. Mm. So are, are you seeing any, um, as you say, real estate centric, are you, any of your clients that you work with, do they have property in rural opportunity zones, or are they primarily urban? Primarily urban, uh, and I think that's just a, a non-statistical sample of, of my clients, but I have been contacted and have worked with uh, clients uh, interested in areas that are more rural, uh, one in fact uh, being agricultural, 
so I think we see opportunities throughout the country. Obviously, with something like 90,000 different census tracts uh, in play, we could see a, a diversity of, of asset types. There has been a bit of a focus, though. I think the single most common theme we've seen in these real estate-centric deals has been student housing. There's an awful lot of enthusiasm for that around USC, for example, here in Los Angeles. Oh, that's interesting. I could definitely see the need for that. Yeah, and that's something that would work all across the country, of course. Uh, Paul, when you're talking about something uh, like a blind pool, can you explain to our audience what that is? Is that just like an accumulation of funds into getting ready to, to purchase an asset? Exactly. So a blind pool is a fund operator that wants to raise an amount of money, typically a target. So in this instance, it was a $500 million fund. And so they got and they raised that through their network of investors, many of whom have invested in funds prior with that particular developer. And then they go out and they identify properties. And in that instance, because their other funds happen to own properties in zones, they may have the ability to, uh, to poach from their own inventory, if you will. But uh, that concept is typically called a blind pool, meaning that uh, the investors buy into the fund without clear uh, guidance on what assets they're actually going to own indirectly through the fund. Uh, A typical structure now would be a single asset or multi-asset fund where the uh, sponsor developer has identified the specific asset and then goes and raises money from investors specific to that deal. Are the investors in these uh, blind pools, are they... uh, entrepreneurial types or are they individuals or is there a trend to either way? I don't know that there is a trend either way. I think that's client specific. Some of my clients um, have a a stronger network with individual investors. Others raise money through family offices. Um, Still others raise institutional capital. And so we're seeing uh, a real mix as far as the deals are concerned. Has has anything changed in terms of what you're doing or the funds that you're working with when the program started in uh, early 2018 to now when uh, new rules and regulations have been issued? Yeah, I think the latest round of rules and regulations have provided a lot of comfort and clarity around multi-asset structures or blind pools for that matter. I think until these recent rules and regulations were in hand, I think there was a lot of uncertainty among lawyers and accountants about uh, tax treatment of uh, multi-asset funds or blind pools. The act itself compelled the Treasury Secretary, if I recall, to promulgate rules that allow for reinvestment. But we didn't have those rules and regulations during round one. So for several months there, during the government shutdown, for for instance, um, a lot of folks were, were very concerned and very shy about pulling the trigger on multi-asset deals, thinking that they would have to be tied up in all of those properties for the full 10 years. Now, of course, we know that there is the ability of a fund to exit a single property and then reinvest within a one-year period, typically, uh, without creating chaos within that qualified opportunity fund. Interesting. interesting. So now when, when people are looking to invest into these funds, uh, they raise money in a blind pool via what, a, a PTM? Do they have a document such as that? Is that what they use? Yeah, so this is a very typical uh, syndicated real estate uh, vehicle. Um, typically, they structure this as a, an LLC, but it could be a corporation. And uh, essentially, it's uh, identical to any other form of uh, blind pool in a real estate context. It just happens to have to uh, tick the boxes of the qualified opportunity zone space. But yes, a PPM and uh, general offering documents would be part of that package sent out to I- investors. All right, what would happen in a situation where a developer wants uh, to create a, a blind pool and, and raise money, let's, like you said, let's say raise a, you know, $100 million, for example, mm-hmm. and uh, they're looking to do this blind pool uh, situation, don't they have to have some kind of a project uh, uh, established or isn't there some kind of a time uh, limit or a time constraint in terms of when that fund is created and when it actually has to start development or or, uh, property identification? Well, there are some very important deadlines within this QOZ space. I mean, we've talked about the 31-month horizon, for instance. And so um, there's a a little bit of an initial ramp-up period, but uh, after that, uh, the fund will have to survive a 90% test, right? So 90% of its assets need to be deployed within QOZ business property um, twice a year. And so, yes, it it becomes a a little bit challenging for the sponsor or developer of a blind pool to deploy that capital as quickly as needed. 
Now, granted, if you're raising $100 million in the example that you've just cited, Ron, I doubt that that $100 million would come in all at once. I mean, if you're Goldman oh, Sachs, right, right. maybe. But for, for most, most operators of blind pools, they go out and their network is busy making calls and introductions, and the money comes in over time. So that allows them to deploy the assets in various ass, um, the capital into various assets in a timely way. And you, know, you can show good cause, too, if you haven't satisfied the 31-month provision. But um, yes, it's, it's a concern. And if you're an investor, that's one of the risks that you need to, to bear in mind when you make the investment. Right, because we've always said that if an, an investor is looking to invest in a fund, certainly it, it helps the fund to have a good reputation with their developer and everybody involved on their team. And that would make an investor a lot more confident about putting money into that. Uh, so it certainly makes sense on, on that angle. Well, exactly. And I think there's a broader point that uh, needs to be emphasized. Uh, and, and we've typically seen this with the folks with whom we're dealing. So investors are not making bad deals just to avoid or defer uh, capital gains tax liability. <laughs> right, we're, right. We're seeing people be pretty smart about it. And then this is just the icing on the cake. Yeah. Okay, now, now let's talk about the business perspective of this now. Somebody comes in and they want to start a business in an opportunity zone. Let's say, for example, uh, they want to create a, a, a barber shop, right? Um, how does that in, impact uh, you know, the legalities of, 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 that, of that fund? Well, let me frame the question so I understand it. Um, you're talking about a qualified opportunity fund that has developed some, some real property, and one of their tenants is a barber shop. Let's yes. use that as example yes. one. Yes, exactly. So, so, so that's perfectly fine. The barber is just a tenant, possibly one of several within this property developed by a qualified opportunity zone business, which is owned by a qualified opportunity fund. So that, that rental income will flow into the business and then ultimately up to the fund. And after 10 years, investors in that fund can sell their membership interests. Um, and, of course, uh, that 10-year that, uh, tax rule provides that they're not going to pay any gain on uh, the investment in the fund over that period of time. Now, it is possible to structure businesses that would serve as tenants that themselves could be uh, beneficiaries of this new QOZ legislation. And, and that's the interesting piece of this latest second proposed rules and regulations we received from the Treasury Department a few weeks ago. And so we're going to start to see much more deal activity there. And if properly structured, the idea is that you can create businesses, again, not real estate related businesses, but operating businesses that um, may allow the, the owners um, not to pay tax after 10 years. So you could imagine some startup opportunities. I think this is going to be very successful in um, the hot spots of entrepreneurism like Silicon Valley and Silicon Beach and Nevada to a, an increasing degree as well. We've seen a lot of entrepreneurs in there following the uh, entrance of Zappos and others to the marketplace. So again, if properly structured with lawyers and accountants, we, we see a, a tremendous opportunity uh, for folks creating new businesses in these areas. And the, 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 re, the rules and regulations provide some safe harbors. There are three safe harbors within these proposed rules that will allow an investor to uh, fit within the four corners of the legislation. And even if they don't, there's a good possibility that it can be structured in a way that uh, the investors can, can profit over the long term and not pay tax on the appreciation in the, the fund. Paul, you know, uh, Vegas, also known as Sin City, um, I know that with the uh, rules and regulations of opportunity zones, there's a provision that re is regarding uh, sin businesses. Can you explain to our listeners what that is? Yeah, the Act identifies certain industries, we'll call them, uh, in which this tax benefit cannot be applied. And I think golf courses, believe it or not, uh, happen to make that, that list of naughties. I'm not sure quite why. Um, <laughs> But uh, one has to be a bit careful about uh, structuring this, and, and you're exactly right, Vicki, that uh, the uh, organizer of the fund needs to be sure that their business plan is consistent with the legislation. So there are certain types of business that would not qualify within the context of this legislation. Well, now there's the trend going across the country of uh, people getting into the cannabis industry. That's something, or is that something that can be uh, part of an opportunity zone? Well, interestingly, cannabis is not on that list of, of naughties. But, of course, at the federal level, cannabis is still a controlled or regulated substance. And so there's a question mark about how exactly that would uh, 
fit into uh, the federal tax scheme. I suppose the, the more conservative view would be if you're directly involved in uh, possession or production of cannabis, that would probably uh, run afoul. But if it's an ancillary business, um, that may not be uh, prohibited. Uh, and so I, I think that's a very complex area that will probably be tested by, by case study. And we'll see what, uh, what rules emerge around that. But uh, at least as far as the black letter of the law is concerned, this new legislation um, does not prohibit cannabis for purposes of qualified opportunity zones. Well, uh, the Las Vegas uh, City Council recently passed an ordinance allowing uh, cannabis lounges, so which are, uh, as I understand it, these are areas where people can gather in public and uh, smoke pot if they want to. So in uh, one of your real estate-centric uh, situations where the fund is developing real estate for businesses, is that a business that could be considered for one of these funds? It seems to be. Possibly. A, yeah, it seems to be based on the, the language as we currently understand it. I, I, again, not want to be the fastest car on the freeway to test that theory. Uh, yes, but, right. right. <laughs> Fact. <laughs> we, we like to hit the golf ball right down the middle of the fairway with these deals. These are new and sufficiently uncertain in their own right. We don't want to be testing the uh, the boundaries. However, people will. And, well, uh, that's true. But sometimes there there is, you know, you don't want to be the risk taker in certain areas. <laughs> Well, that's right. And I don't think that running afoul of this is catastrophic. The question then becomes what happens to the prior gain that you're trying to defer. So then you may end up having to uh, to pay that gain sooner than you otherwise would have. And of course, your investment in the fund would not be tax exempt after 10 years, which is one of the primary drivers for this scheme. Can, yeah. can you explain to our listeners uh, why they should invest in a real uh, an opportunity zone fund as opposed to, say, a 1031 exchange, what the difference would be? Yeah, there's a lot of talk about those two and the comparisons and the similarities and differences. So um, apples and oranges for sure. Um, for one, the 2017 Tax Act, the Jobs Act uh, that uh, Trump's administration was able to sign into law, provide some clarity on 1031s now. It used to be like-kind exchange could apply to something beyond real estate. We now know that the 1031 concept will apply only to real property. So as a, an example, if you're an investor who very timely bought shares of Apple or Amazon or Google, for instance, to use these popular examples, you now have, a, say, a $10 million gain, and you want to sell that stock and realize that gain but not pay immediately the, the tax burden you can invest the capital gain received from your investment uh, upon sale into a quasi opportunity fund and defer the tax until early 2027 under the QOZ rules. So 1031 would not be available in that instance, right, because the gain was not generated through real property. Now, if you are a real property investor, 1031 still has some advantages. For one, it can apply to any real estate typically. It's not limited to real estate within qualified opportunity zones. So again, very s similar in some respects and, and very different in others. But the QOZ concept is broader in many ways because it can allow an investor from any type of gain to defer the tax liability attached to that capital gain. Um, so collector cars, stocks as we just discussed, and uh, the sale of a business, for instance. So it's a, a much broader tax benefit than 1031, which has now been very narrowly defined and limited to real estate. Now, a critical difference, though, in favor of a 1031 deferral, that is an indefinite deferral, as opposed to an investment in a qualified opportunity fund, which is only a temporary deferral until December 31, 2026. Okay. Right, well, that, that means that in, in a 1031, you could just keep rolling it over and over and over. Is that exactly. Right? Exactly. Yeah, so for yeah. clients of ours, for instance, who are committed real estate investors and just occasionally, uh, maybe twice or three times in a generation, will want to sell and, and roll into some other form of real property, 1031 still makes a lot of sense. And so at the, uh, at the point of death, uh, the heirs get a step up in basis. So under the U.S. tax code as it currently exists, 1031 is a great way to cheat the tax man indefinitely. Right, right, right. Are most of these properties uh, triple, triple, triple N properties that you're seeing on the 1031? 
Well, I think so, at least on the commercial side. Um, you know, there are obviously some residential plays, and some of my clients are very residential heavy. Um, we've been seeing yeah. multifamily projects and so on and so forth. Those, those are not typically triple net, and, and certainly the single-family home space is not triple net. Okay. When we spoke to uh, one of our previous guests was a CPA, and he talked about uh, issues with uh, opportunity zones and uh, uh, tax deferrals in that, even though at the federal level you have a deferral, but when you get down into the state level where your investment actually is working, where the zones actually are located, now you have issues with state and local taxes. Have you uh, come across anything that creates an issue for you or any of the uh, funds or clients you work with? Well, that's exactly right, Vic, and that's an important point. So right now the, the federal tax can be deferred uh, under this new scheme, but very few states have actually implemented uh, parallel legislation at the state level. And so California is a very good example. I'm here in Los Angeles, a number of my clients are, and so for anyone investing in a qualified opportunity fund who happens to be a California taxpayer, you're still forced to pay the California uh, tax on your prior gain. Now, the state of California is very interested in this, and I wouldn't be surprised if they do implement legislation to follow the federal example, uh, but for the moment they haven't. And so um, the deferral is, again, limited to the federal piece. There are other states, however, which have implemented legislation. And so uh, folks who are resident in those jurisdictions um, can similarly defer their, their state or local taxes in some instances. And then, of course, there are great states like Nevada and Florida and Texas and Washington that do not have a state income tax. And so it's a non-issue right from the start. Right. And, and do you foresee in the future where more states will see that more investments will come into their opportunity zones if they modify not only their, their tax laws to make them equal with the federal laws, but also just the process of developing real estate or getting projects through the red tape of a local municipality? I think that's exactly right. There's going to be a little competition, right, for investment from qualified opportunity funds. I've been contacted even by mayors of small or mid-sized municipalities saying, what can we do to enhance our ability to attract investment in our qualified opportunity zones here in our jurisdiction? And of course, there are things that can be done. And there's nothing that prohibits the stacking of tax credits. So some jurisdictions are going to be far more attractive than others. But ultimately, we don't want the tax tail to wag the dog, as the old expression goes. So I, I don't want to see investors or clients pouring money into bad deals just to, uh, to get a tax break. I think the deal needs to make sense in its own right. And then, of course, this is the icing on the cake. But again, some jurisdictions are going to be far more attractive um, than others. We found that uh, uh, jurisdictions here in Las Vegas, for instance, Henderson and uh, North Las Vegas, have implemented incentives at a local level to make the process easier, to make the, the uh, approval process easier, the tax situation easier, all of that, just so they can attract people, uh, investors into their zones because of those things. And it's working out great for them. I think that's a smart move, and I would applaud uh, the uh, professionals working for the city of Henderson and the city of North Las Vegas who have implemented those provisions. Again, and I believe move. you'll meet some at the expo. Yes, you will. Yeah, you will. <laughs> yes, because we to happen that. to know that they will be going. <laughs> well, you know and, what's interesting about the California perspective too, uh, Paul, is that there's so many people in California who have uh, gained so much in capital gains with the sale of their homes. The real estate has just skyrocketed there so much over the last uh, years. And, and you would think that California would really want to get their act together on that, on that end of it too, because that's where a lot of investors seem to, to arise from. They're making some tremendous uh, capital gains exposure in, in that area. Exactly. Well said. Yeah. Well, California, of course, has a big budget, and we know they like to collect their tax revenue. They're very aggressive in that <laughs> respect. <laughs> Yes, they what are. about yes. um, specific investors like we often, Ron and I have thought that this is opportunity zone investing is a, a unique opportunity, for example, for uh, celebrities, sports figures, that kind of um, class of folk that 
generate a lot of income and now have an ability to invest in a fund or create a fund so that they have that kind of pull at your heartstrings concept where we're giving back to the community, we're doing things for the community. And do, do you see a trend like that or do you have clients along, that, along those lines? Well, I think that's exactly right again, Vicki. It's a good observation. I, I don't know that we've seen a lot of that yet because this is still too new to have attracted folks uh, from the sort of uh, high-profile industries you've described, but I think it's a, a very good move for folks who want to do that. For those with a, a high current income uh, who want to make strategic investments and do well by doing good, as the old phrase goes, I think this is a very attractive program. And so um, they can do that in places like Detroit and, and other jurisdictions that uh, you know have not had the economic prosperity that maybe we've enjoyed in other places like California and Nevada, and give back to the community in that way. And of course, their long-term investment would potentially accrue without taxable gain. Right. And in Las Vegas, we have a lot of celebrities, a lot of sports folks like Andre Agassi, who develop in uh, low-income areas and 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 uh, have schools and have uh, recreational areas and that for the community in low income areas of the city and and so it's just would follow that they would want to take advantage of the opportunity zones as well as just in general well I agree and I think one of the point needs to be raised for the benefit of your listeners. When we talk about qualified opportunity funds, I think the word fund can be very misleading. Fund typically implies in an ordinary context the pooling of money from two or more investors. Um, and that isn't the case here. A fund can be a single person's investment. Correct. Right? I can have my own fund. You can have your own fund, Vicki. And Ron, you also. Um, we can also joint venture, right? So your fund can combine forces with my fund, and we can each own part of a qualified opportunity zone business, for instance. So again, with the right lawyer and the right accountant, all sorts of creative structures can be created to achieve a very good result. And I think, again, the target audience you've uh, mentioned with your comment, Vicki, is exactly spot on. Yeah, and, I, and this is, to, to, from my point of view, this is what opportunity zones were created for when President Trump created this concept, it was to specifically go to the areas that are most in need of development, bring the money into them by giving them a tax incentive, but allow people to elevate the community and the people who live in those communities so that in the end, everybody at the table feels good about what they've accomplished. Yes, exactly. Doing well by doing good. Exactly correct. Like that. Yes, that's the, that's the phrase of the day right there. Paul, you nailed it. That was great. Uh, Paul, how do, how do people get a hold of you if they need more information? Do you have a website, phone number, email? How do, what well, do you like? Yeah, as a client of mine used to say, Paul, you can run, but you can't hide. So it's easy to find <laughs> lawyers these days, right, in the age of the Internet. Well, that's maybe a sad fact. <laughs> Well, the easiest way to find me professionally is through my firm. I'm a partner with DLA Piper, which is one of the world's largest. And so we have a, a robust uh, web presence, uh, dlapiper.com. And uh, again, my name is Paul Oskram, so you can pull up my profile and my picture and see the deals I've done and all those good credentials. Uh, and of course, uh, I'm officed here typically in Los Angeles, but travel throughout the country and for many years lived on the other side of the Cactus Curtain, the tax-free side in Nevada. So, uh, there you go. Right, right, exactly. So then, uh, you know, uh, one other thing I want to talk about is uh, you, you mentioned that you're going, to be a, uh, you're going to lead a panel over at the Opportunity Zones Expo. Uh, what's the topic of that panel? Well, we have an exciting topic, and I think this would appeal to a lot of folks. So uh, it's standing out, how deals differ in size, risk, focus, and structure. And we're going to be spending a lot of time talking about the different structures that now work after these latest rules and regulations have arisen. Oh, okay. to structure the actual funds. Exactly. There are some variations on the theme that I described earlier in our call, and I think some work better than others. It's all very deal-specific. And again, you've got to get the right lawyer and the right accountant involved to be sure all the I's are dotted and the T's crossed. Yeah. Okay. All right. Great. Well, we're looking forward to that for sure. Looking forward to meeting you, Paul, in the next couple of days. And I want to really thank you for taking the time out for being on the podcast. This was really informational. I, r I really appreciate you coming on. Well, thank you both for the invitation and for having me. And I just want to say one last thing that anybody listening, there's still an opportunity to 
attend the Opportunity Zone Expo here in Vegas, May 9th and 10th. Go to our website and uh, you will find a registration with a $100 discount on tickets. All right, excellent, excellent. And, and everything that we talked about, guys, by the way, all you listeners out there, it's all going to be put in the show notes. So you, if you just click on the links there, it'll go to Paul's website and everything else. And uh, we're, we're going to make it real easy for you to get to this conference and everything else. So we're, we enjoy bringing this information to you. Thank you all for listening. You're listening to the Mappable USA podcast. We're over at mappableusa.com. Go to that website, scroll down, you'll see a whole bunch of syndication sources. You pick the one you like the best. And that way you'll never miss an episode. And if you want to be a guest on today's show like Paul did, there's a guest tab there. Fill that out, and we'll see what we can do about getting you on the show as well. So once again, everyone, thank you for listening. Thank you, Paul, for being on the show. Thanks, Vicki, for the co-host. And we'll see you all on the next Mappable USA podcast. Have a great week, everyone. Bye.